even read this, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. I'm David Theo Goldberg, the director of the UC Humanities Research Institute and a faculty on campus, um, to this uh, talk by Brad Evans. Uh, before I introduce him, I just want to make another announcement. There'll be a talk at five o'clock this afternoon in the social sciences by Neoma Younger, who's an artist in residence at UCHRI at the moment. Uh, He'll be talking about revolting music, which is not music that's revolting, but music that is about revolt and revolution. <laughs> um, and Neo's a fantastic musician and really interesting historian of protest music uh, from South Africa. Uh, and it will be, I think, in 1100 uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the social science building, that big, huge, uh, and they're expecting a big crowd, so, uh, but um, do show up, uh, it'll be really interesting. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Brad Evans. Brad is a professor of international politics and international relations at the University of Bristol. Uh, he runs a really interesting website, if you haven't taken a look at it, you should, called Histories of Violence. It's historiesofviolence.com, right? Um, uh, that includes all kinds of videos and interviews with notable theori theoreticians, critical theorists around questions of violence in its variety of applications. Um, he has recently published a book uh, with City Lights Press, uh, co-authored with Henry Giroux, uh, called Disposable Futures, um, and he has the kind of counter book to that uh, before it called Resilient Lives. So on the one hand, Disposable Futures, on the other hand, Resilient Lives. Uh, and he's a very interesting thinker, uh, critical theorist, uh, international relations theorist uh, in uh, the British tradition of those terms. So without further ado, uh, Brad, he'll be talking uh, on a, a topic called uh, Dead in the Water, Dead in Waters. Uh, about the current refugee condition um, uh, regarding Europe. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Brad Evans. Uh, thanks for inviting me, David. Um, I guess I should give um, a slight just warning beforehand for people who have just come in. Um, Invariably, given the, the topic that I'm speaking to, it's, it's quite a bleak topic. And there are one or two images which I will show very briefly, which kind of emphasize the importance of some of the aesthetics around this. And I guess I should kind of put that out at the beginning, because some of you are in a particular disposition against these kind of things. Um, now, the talk I am going to give today, I guess, develops on from a number of the conceptual themes which was introduced in my co-authored book, and I'm going to kind of plug it again with, with Henry, uh, called Disposable Futures. And... In particular, the engagement we do in the final chapter with the concept of intolerable violence, or indeed, what actually makes something an intolerable image to us, and how we can link this to both the spectacle of violence and politics of aesthetics. Um, now, in this talk, I'm going to speak directly to some of those ideas and kind of extend them in, onto a new book project, which I'm working on at the minute, um, which is, looks at the relationship between symbolic violence and what I'm calling the scenes of the sacrificial and in particular, I try to understand what makes somebody a sacrificial victim. Now, before going into the specificity of this talk, um, I think it's worth perhaps outlining the wider project, just to give you a sense of its specificity and, and how it links particularly to the problematic of violence. Now, as probably most of you are aware, what actually constitutes violence is a question which gets us into the heart of critical thought. Violence, in fact, is never value neutral or objective nor should it be theorized in the abstract. Violence is not an object to be studied. It's a lived process, which through its very enactment authenticates and disqualifies the meaning of lives. Now, one of the questions I'd like to broach with you today and something that runs right throughout my work, uh, hopefully, is to build up on what Walter Benjamin's claim that what we need to do is develop a critique of violence which is adequate to our present condition, i.e. how do we develop a critique of violence that does ethical justice to the subject? This requires, I would argue, moving away from asking what is violence. Such a question it simply ends up confirming pre-existing normative and political ideas regarding the world. An alternative critique of violence attempts to understand the ways in which violence functions politically, 
especially in terms of its daily spectacles, to which all of us here are continuously forced witness. Such a critique attends to the politics of violence by asking what subjectivities are actually produced through its performance, which in turn asks how violence comes to shape political and philosophical understanding. Violence in this regard, I maintain, is an original problem that positively and negatively shapes all human relations. Violence, in short, is a condition of possibility for the furtherance of political rule. Now, to gain some handle on this, let's turn for a moment to Auguste Rodin's sculpture, The Thinker, which is arguably still one of the most famous human embodiments of philosophical and critical inquiry. The symbolic form given to Rodin's isolated and contemplative sculpture alone should raise a whole number of critical concerns for us, not least the ways in which its ethnic, masculine, and athletic form speak to evident racial, gendered, and biopolitical grammars. However, what also concerns the viewer is an attempt to engage in some form of conversation with this work. In its presence, we're invariably asked to contemplate what the thinker is actually contemplating. Now, from this picture, we might suggest that the thinker could be thinking about anything in particular. We just hope that it's something serious. However, such ambiguity in terms of its contemplative meaning was not as originally intended. Here we have a picture from the original 1880 sculpture where the thinker is now situated kneeling before the gates of hell. We might these, read this as significant for a whole number of reasons. It is the scene of violence and its theatricality which gives specific content to Rodin's thinker. Thought begins for the thinker in the presence of the raw realities of violence and suffering. The thinker is actually forced to suffer into truth. The thinker's physical posture is, in fact, determined by what we can call a scenic multiplicity of performances, violent performances, whose brutalities are now often obscured or hidden in the now more familiar, isolated depictions. Two, there is an interest in ambiguity here, however, in terms of the thinker's relationship to violence. As we see here, the, the thinker actually seems to be turning away from the intolerable scene behind to contemplate the violence. This, I would argue, is a tendency unfortunately all too common when thinking about violence today, to turn away and then contemplate. Three, according to one purposeful reading, the figure in this commission is actually Dante, the poet, who is contemplating the circles of hell as narrated in the Divine Comedy. This is significant, for rather than looking away, might it be that the, actu that the figure is actually staring directly into the abyss below? Hence, I think it is consciously facing the intolerable, and thus symbolizing the ethical problem of witnessing violence. What is more and more problematic still, as Edward Said noted, it is with Dante that Orientalism begins to, truly ass to assume a truly monumental intellectual force. Seeing others as a problem to be solved begins out asserting claims to violence, born of a particular narrative of witnessing its events, something which Franz Fanon understood all too well. For while the gates of hell are eventually removed from subsequent reproductions, as many theorists have noted, modernity is arguably the failed secularization of many theological concepts. Indeed, as I will argue here, contemporary aesthetics are actually proliferated with theological resonances, which continue to subtly shape the hidden order in culture and politics today. Fifth and finally, not in any way incidental, in the original commission, the, th the thinker was actually called the poet. This, I want to argue, is deeply significant for actually rethinking the future of the political. The thinker was actually conceived as both a being with a tortured body, almost a damned soul, and yet a free-thinking human, determined to transcend its suffering through poetry. We are, of course, continuing to, taught, to be taught that politics is the exclusive realm of social science, and its true command is located in the power of analytical reason. Such, unfortunately, has been the hallmark of centuries of reasoned, rationalized, and calculated violence in the name of human progress. Violence, we might argue, which has made the intolerable appear altogether arbitrary and normal. Countered in this, I want to argue in this project, and I have argued elsewhere, demands a rethinking of the political itself as a more poetic art form, which is tasked with imagining better futures, futures and styles for living amongst the world of people. Okay, so on to the specificity of the talk, and... I want to start with this quote. In 1970, the author J.G. Ballard uh, famously wrote an experimental novel titled The Atrocity Exhibition. Aside from its disruptive style, this work highlighted the potency of Ballard's speculative fictionalism 
It also provided some insightful commentary on the emerging political terrain, which would be increasingly defined by the media spectacle and how this would radically alter our sense of spatial awareness. As Ballard writes, the media landscape of the present day is a map in search of a territory. A huge volume of sensational and often toxic imagery inundates our minds, much of it fictional in content. How do we make sense of this ceaseless flow of advertising and publicity, news and entertainment, where presidential campaigns and moon voyages are presented indistinguishable from the launch of a new candy bar or deodorant? What happens on the level of our unconscious minds when, within minutes on the same TV screen, a prime minister is assassinated, an actress makes love, an injured child is carried from a car? Faced with these charged events, pre-packaged emotions already in place, we can only stitch together a set of emergency scenarios just as our sleeping minds extemporaneous a narrative from the unrelated memories that veer through the cortical night. What Ballard, of course, is pointing to is the screen culture in which we encounter today and the proliferation of Im immediate threats through which we can very seldom get, get even a tangible purchase upon, let alone understand with any sense of um, intricate detail. On Wednesday, September the 2nd, 2015, the body of a young, helpless refugee washed up on the shores of the Mediterranean. His name was Alian Kurdi, a three-year-old child whose family was fleeing the conflict and violence tearing apart the place he once called home. The devastating image of this senseless and disturbing tragedy reverberated across social media, in particular in the United Kingdom and in Western Europe. The hashtag flotsam of humanity accompanied the painful image. While it is always difficult to measure the scale of impact of such moments, it was no doubt evident to many commentators that something was beginning to change in the public attitude and the broader political discourse. Alian thus became a potent symbol around which various humanitarian claims coalesced, concentrating in the process the unnecessary suffering endured by so many who have suffered a similar fate and ended up dead in the waters. Alian seemed to speak in death to the sacrificial weight of recent history. His water-soaked body laid face down and lifeless on the beach resonates with what I previously called the intolerable as a way to disrupt the aesthetic field of perceptions. Namely, it offered a fundamental rupture or a breakthrough in how we come to know and see the world, how we came to know and see the crisis. A shattering, if you like, of what the theorist Jack Ronciere has called the distribution of the sensible. It captured a truly intolerable moment. Its portrait was something too difficult to bear, yet it was impossible to ignore. Allian's image certainly wasn't as vivid as other images of the crisis, which had been circulating around the internet for some considerable time. But maybe that's the point. In the age of the spectacle, where lives are continuously rendered disposable, while the extreme parades is entertainment, while the graphic echoes the pornographic, forced witnessing to tragic events often work by harvesting our attentions, but for a moment's reflection. It's all about looking without actually seeing the wider political context. What then becomes more powerful and expressive in this overtly politicized and mediatized setting are image events that don't always follow some sensational scripting. Rather, depictions unsettle because their intimate portrayals foster all too human connections. This is not some abstract philosophical question of death. It's to face the raw reality of its presence. Whilst Allian's image undoubtedly sparked more somber political reflections and mobilized a certain ethical awakening in terms of the crisis, there is a fundamental question which still remains. Why did the image of this particular boy, amongst all others, have such a notable political and emotional effect? As Hugh Pinney, the vice president of Getty Images noted, the reason we're talking about this photograph is not because it's been taken or not, but because it's been publicized by the mainstream media. It breaks the social taboo that's been in place for over a decade. The picture of a dead child is one of the golden rules that you never publish. Pinney's comments invariably invoke memories here of Nick Oot's famous image of Kim Pook, whose naked and burnt body became an iconic symbol of the Vietnam War, remaining one of the most enduring images of warfare in the 20th century. It is difficult, however, to explain the media events surrounding An Yun's death by simply pointing to some shared empathy, as if the pictures, which exposed us to the horrifying radical contingencies of the tragedy, perfectly reg resonated with the sens sensibilities of picture editors and media alike. No image can be afforded such a universal status. Just a few days prior, for example, the artist Khaled Barakai, 
published a series of equally tragic images of um, dead Syrian and Palestinian children whose boat had on this occasion had capsized off the coast of Libya in a mournful and devastating series titled Multicultural Graveyard. Such images quickly spread across the internet and social media, though on this occasion Facebook quickly shut them down because apparently it contravened its, images on, its, its rules on publishing of graphic content. Did the image of Alien then just happen to take us over a tipping point? Did it actually expose the limits of censorship and the mediation of aesthetic regimes of suffering? Or was there something more relatable about the composition? Hence, it resonated not because the image was exceptional or out of the ordinary. Instead, it unsettled us because it was all too relatable to our normal, albeit disrupted, images of the world. How many tourist pictures are, after all, taken of children smiling, dancing, and rolling around on the beaches of the Mediterranean? Such images certainly force us to confront an alternative reality of disposable children perishing on the same shores. As Peter Brokart, a director of Human Rights Watch, reflected, what struck me most were his little sneakers. Staring at the image, I couldn't help imagine that it was one of my own sons lying there drowned on the beach. Brokart then added with a tragic honesty, this is a child that looks a lot like a European child. The weeks before, dozens of African kids washed up on the beaches of Libya and were photographed and it didn't have the same impact. There is some ethnocentrism in the reaction to this image, certainly. As we've come to understand, aesthetics are crucial to any understanding of power relations. How we narrate images are in fact crucial to the, um, to the authentication and the disqualification of the meaning of lives. Images alone, however, offer no sure guarantee for immediate or lasting impact and change. Why certain images resonate draw upon a whole number of complex and competing political, social, cultural, and indeed religious investments, which defy neat explanation or blueprinting in terms of developing some perfectible formula. That is not to say, however, that images are incapable of being manipulated. Images are selected for public consumption to reinforce narratives and agendas, which in the process of revealing quite formulaic tendencies can function in politically contrived ways, such that prescribed change is regulated and heavily policed. We can begin to engage this by connecting the image of Alien to other tragic images head headlining a widespread circulation at the time of his tragic death. A day before Barakai's images appeared, Another refugee story dominated the media landscape in continental Europe. On this occasion, some 70 badly decomposed bodies were discovered in an airtight cooler lorry, which was left abandoned on the roadside in eastern Austria. A number of the victims, again, were children. Whilst the images of suffering was less explicit in being confronted with the actual bodies of the victims, its tragic potency was all too apparent as the truck's intended produce was processed meats for public consumption. The symbolic nature of this um, supplementing of disposable cargo seemingly eluded news and media outlets, something students of biopolitics would have readily appreciated and rightly critiqued in terms of its evident neoliberal resonance. And as a tragic um, aesthetic transference taking place with the image of a cameraman taking the photograph of a forensic cameraman who's taking a photograph of the disposable cargo. Such differing fortunes in terms of mobilising a response raise fundamental questions regarding the power of images and their capacity to bring about genuine political change. Alien's image resonated powerful in it, powerfully in its singularity. The other 11 who died on, when the same boat capsized don't feature in the frame. This raises searching questions regarding the mediation of depicted suffering demanding much further critical awareness in terms of how the spectacle has become a defining organisational principle for modern societies. In a particularly insightful commentary, Nicholas Mertzoff refocuses our attention on the preferred mainstream media image depicting the young child cradled in the arms of a Turkish policeman. Why this composition impacted, as Mertzoff suggested, might be explained in terms of Christian iconography. To quote... We can open our eyes to this photograph because it reminds us of images we know all too well. Such images carry the power of the sacred. The posture of the policeman, Sergeant Mehmet Kiplak, who carries Alian's body, unconsciously echoes one of the key icons of Western art. Known as Pieta, meaning pity, this frequently explored motif depicts the Virgin Mary holding the body of Christ as he was taken down from the cross. <clears throat> 
For those of you who are unaware, this is Michelangelo's Pieta on the left. And I've actually referred to this previously in my critique of humanitarian aesthetics, notably Time Magazine's coverage of the Ethiopian famine during the 1980s. It is worth remembering that the Pieta style representation was deemed the most appropriate by the media outlets. For he and Jack, this was explainable as it suits a finer idea of humanity, as the first image shown represents the less comfortable proposition that death reduces even the liveliest child to a heap of flesh and bone. But this brings me to perhaps more you know, to the, the real uh, focus of my talk, really. And that is to raise, I guess, the fundamental question about what does it mean for critical thinkers and for pedagogues to reproduce this image, to mediate upon it, to write about it in the presence of our, the company of our own loved ones, indeed our own children, while remaining ethically sensitive to the senselessness, devastatingly intimate, and terrifying contingency of its occurrence. That is to say, how do we deal with the burdens of this image without becoming parasitic to the violence, latently dwelling upon its horror, and at worst, normalizing its reception through repetition, which at best will point to banalization, and at worst reduces it to yet another spectacle of violence. As Kent Brintnell notes while commenting on the male body in pain, representations of suffering bodies per se are a screen, a surface burnished with history's erasure. Of course, representations of violated bodies do not always function this way. Cruelty, humor, voyeurism, and often indifference intervene. Mirrors warp. Too often the desire to explain is often the desire to explain away to justify and somehow diminish the, the horror. I want to make clear here that I have no interest whatsoever in theorizing aesthetics for the sake of any academic discipline, nor do I want to engage with aesthetics so that we might glean something of the political out of modes of representation to authenticate some sovereign gaze. To my mind, certainly, and I can speak maybe for the UK here, uh, there are far too many sovereign academics in the world who seem to claim some privileged vantage point. Like Jacques Rancière, it's my contention that politics is aesthetic, in so much as it is inextricably bound to the creation of images of thought, images of the world even, but not always according to some universal blueprint that paves the way to the castle of pure reason. On the contrary, as George Bataille has observed, for aesthetics to be meaningful, it is necessary to give words the power to open eyes, to use words no longer to serve the ends of knowledge but of sight as if they were no longer intelligible signs, but cries. It is, in other words, to connect the aesthetic with the poetic, the image with the discourse, such that the intolerable is always confronted and apprehended. Alongside images such as Alien, we also find emerging a number of complementary aesthetic themes concerning the nature of the crisis, which are no less iconic and theological in terms of narrating tales of political salvation and earthly redemption. Let's take the image of Antonius de la Gregoris, a Greek army sergeant who was captured saving the 24-year-old Etrian woman, Wagasi uh, Nabiat. This particular image from April 2015 again went viral and featured on the front pages of many news outlets, including the New York Times. It was narrated as part of an heroic effort by Antonius, and some journals actually called him Adonis, um, who in the process of rescuing some 20 refugees uh, was subsequently awarded the Cross of Excellency. And yet the latent racial and gendered stakes to this image are all too apparent. It speaks directly to militaristic valor, and as many commentators sub subtly and explicitly mentioned, the notable beautification of both figures in the heroic scene, one even went as far as to say it looked like something out of a James Bond movie. The following images included the covers of The Economist and the special report by Time magazine also explicitly return us to the theological. Biblical stories of Exodus are bound up with tales of human flight from persecution and have often been used by political regimes and leaders in order to galvanize support for political causes, not least justice through violence. Now what concerns me here are the subtle and apparent secularized adaptations which remain loaded with political and theological significance. Indeed, as I am arguing in various chapters in this new book I'm developing, the recurring motifs of images concerning ideas of uh, redemption and salvation link specifically to racial and sexualized grammars, often born of the logics of what Walter Benjamin has called mythical violence. Taken together, what we're beginning to uncover here, I think, is an in intimate portrayal of the encounter with contemporary violence. 
which speaks directly to questions of human sacrifice, the status of, uh, status of victims onto ideas of militaristic valor and the aesthetic mediation of suffering. It's worth reminding ourselves here of Francois Laurel's important contribution from his general theory of the victim. Yuri explains the need for a more nuanced and ethically informed engagement with those who needlessly suffer from the catastrophic weight of history. To quote, the victim's overrepresentation is the foregrounding of its origin, its necessity and its contingency. Like any term that sees its media moment arrive, the victim passes to a stage of expansion and then of nausea, of ascendance and decline. The victim, however, has become a new ethical value, a point of condensation and effervescence all too apparent in the pursuit of ideological conflicts. Nowhere has this been more apparent than the re recycling of the image of Alien to further the calls for the mobilization of war in order to eventually bring about lasting peace. It also connects to the calls for justice, which displace in the history of the, con the conflict, notably including our complicities in it, by focusing instead on the new demonic figure of, global human, of the global human crisis, the people smuggler. If there is a crime to be put on trial, it's not the continued recourse to violence, which ultimately works on all sides by violently exacerbating the conflict in order to control it. It's those who are ultimately part of the clandestine human process of human migration. The complex and often hidden biographies of the smugglers are of no consequence. The political hijacking of the Mediterranean crisis has been predictable and deplorable. It's worth pointing out that in the UK, the very same day that the British Prime Minister David Cameron addressed the British Parliament, pledging his support for the refugees on account of witnessing the image of Alien, he announced in the very same speech that for the first time in its history, the British government had used drone technologies to assassinate British citizens in Syria. The right-wing media's about turn on the refugee problem, which is also notable following the Alien image, also became increasingly clear as the days went by. Here we have a headline from Rupert Murdoch's The Sun Tabloid, which justifies violence and bombing in the name of the child, as it reads for Alien. To use the child's image in this way is arguably fascistic in the way that Wilhelm Reich understood the term. It's all about manipulating the desire for justice, such that an intolerable image of a dead child is appropriated, repackaged, and strategically redeployed to sanction further violence and destruction. So once again, like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, to name a few, the drumbeats to war are orchestrated by showing an apparent sympathy with an all-too-human crisis. Not, however, to provoke serious political and philosophical discussion on the violence and the disposability of populations, instead to end up punishing those in whose name we claim to be acting for in the first place. Such seems to be the cyclical nature of violence in our times. Now, one of my ambitions with the forthcoming project is to conduct an alternative genealogy of the elements as something as integral to understanding the scenes of violence and to rethink the very idea of political geographies. Now, in my previous publications, I've already attended to the ways in which deserts are now reappearing as integral to global imaginaries of threat. The oceans, in so many ways, are also increasingly part of this catastrophic topography of endangerment. I'm not, of course, arguing you that we have now suddenly discovered that deserts and oceans have a political value or significance. On the contrary, my own interest is to look at the ways in which they've always been ascribed with political and philosophical meaning and how the present provides a window into particular historical framings and narratives of human survivability. As somebody who's been studying again the work of Achilles and Sophocles, it's remarkable how much political and ontological symbolism is attributed to the, the elements. Historians might also encourage us here to even look back at the political legacies of the Roman Empire, for whom the, the oceans had a very special meaning and were seen as essential to its vision of the world, mare nostrum, literally the body of water. Now, one of the chapters in the forthcoming book will look specifically at the way that um, space is always violently embodied. And a poignant example of what I'm actually titling with the chapter, The Flesh of the Earth, appears in this very famous scene from Roland Joffe's cinematic score, The Killing Fields. Yet with remarkable similarity to this scene, we can also point to the violent embodiment of the waters, none more so again than with the writings of Dante, as scribed during Gustave Dore's famous illustration for the Divine Comedy. The embodiment of the waters has, in fact, as Carl Schmitt theorized, 
been pivotal to the development of the key ordering principles that have come to define worldly affairs. It's also perhaps worth pointing out to you that the very term the Leviathan, which is often now associated with sovereignty, made famous, of course, by um, Thomas Hobbes, and Thomas Hobbes's cover for the book Leviathan, of course, gives rise to the very idea of the notion of the body politic, actually originally referred to the beast of the oceans. Hence, just as we may write of the violent history of the earth, as familiar biological terms such as dissection have been applied with equal force to populated spaces, so the planetary waters also tell their own stories of violence and oppression. However, whereas the scars of suffering often leave permanent marks and traces upon geographical landscapes, the body of water, like the desert plains, retains its capacity for disappearance. Lost at sea often to vanish without a trace. Contemporary stories regarding the unnecessary suffering of bodies at the mercy of the oceans resurrects the wretched ghosts of the transatlantic slave trade wherein the commodification of life resulted in the genocide of millions of Africans. The oceans are, in fact, the veritable graveyard of human disposability, as shown here in Turner's famous painting, The Slave Ship. Oceans speak to the untraceable histories of those who were violently uprooted from their homes, whether to be sold like cattle or putting themselves in truly perilous positions since the oceans appear more secure than what is being left behind. In doing so, the waters point to a spatial genealogy of violence though for its victims, forms of remembrance are much more difficult to locate. With this in mind, it's my argument that we need to keep hold of the uh, idea that space is always embodied as far as politics is concerned. Geographical demarcations in themselves would prove completely insignificant were they not underwritten by political and philosophical claims of habitus. It is life that always bestows particular meaning upon otherwise empty signifiers of spatial integrities and habitual residency. Space in this regard is always overlaid with certain meanings and attributes which point directly to assumptions made about its inhabitants. What, however, makes a departure in the contemporary moment is the realisation that the oceans and the deserts are now the fi final frontiers in a world that is assumed to be full. People are quite literally being pushed to the ends of the earth. What is therefore demanded is a logical inversion of spatial politics, not in ways that continue to prioritise geographical demarcations over its human content, thereby concealing pre-existing biopolitical assumptions about the human condition. Rather, it is to look at the way in which the body itself provides critical insight into new violent geographies, which have long since abandoned centuries of topographical awareness. Inversion requires foregrounding the life of the human subject in ways that are attendant to those forces which are now overwhelming the logics of containment. Or as Herman Melvin would write, it's not on any, on any map. True places never are. In terms of looking at the alternatives to the violence of the oceans, wherein the waters themselves now appear as a weapon of war, imbued with its own lethal principles, it might be tempting to follow the legacy of Schmidt via the work of Giorgio Agamben to try and once again to return to the understanding of the spatial figuration of the camp as the defining feature of the present moment. The Syrian refugee is certainly exposed to the violence of the camp, which in terms of scale alone seems to de deny meaningful political and ethical responses. Of the 1.8 million registered refugees to be officially documented since the start of the conflict in March 2011, the Zatari refugee camp situated in the middle of the Jordanian desert, for example, homes some 80,000 refugees, all living in makeshift tents within a five mile radius. And this makes it actually the fourth largest city in the country. Now, as Mark Duffield has argued, since the 1980s, populations have been routinely contained in such camps in order to better manage the life chance divide separating the global north and the global south. Such divides, however, are never geographically fixed. Rather, they are determined by the individual biographies of those who request passage. Borders in this regard have always been embodied and biopolitically authored. Whilst there is a broader, broader genealogy to consider you, that certainly takes us back to the Palestinian crisis of 1947, and indeed we could argue much further. I do think it's important to situate the contemporary en masse displacements in a global neoliberal context, not least the wars of the past 15 years. Nobody has understood the plight of the refugees better than Zygmunt Bauman. As he has explained, what defines the contemporary condition of the refugee is a frozen transience where the preferred method of encampment means they are catapulted literally into a nowhere, or as he says, they're often 
literally, literally thrown into the deserts. Such enclosures, however, should not be interrogated by simply uh, drawing upon security or legal rights-based discourses. They demand ethical critique, which is appreciative of the history of the violence of the camp, looks directly in terms of the ethical distancing they create amongst the world of people, as its inhabitants are reduced to a problem population, often stripped of political agency. What the refugee, however, evidence today is the crisis of containment. Whether that refers to the desire to flee water situations instead of waiting for some international response, which in the end will seek a local solution to the problem in order to maintain the integrity of borders, or to actively resist policies of encampment. That many prefer to make the treacherous journey across the Mediterranean instead of seeking refuge in the camps of neighboring Arab states speaks volumes in this regard. Indeed, while some policymakers write of this in terms of economic opportunism, as images from mainland Europe have shown, the refugee is fully aware of the political function of the camp and how its humanitarian ascriptions are merely illusionary. Here we have an image of refugees being um, put onto a train in Hungary, and as each of the sign clearly says, no camp. Containment is therefore in crisis, as camps are being overwhelmed physically, ethically, and politically. This should come as no surprise. In today's radically interconnected world, defined and shaped by global imaginaries of threat, the camp has been subsumed within broader logics of power, which adds further depth to Sloterdijk's idea of the world interior. So this raises a fundamental question, and that is, how might we better deal with the violence faced by refugees in more ethically astute ways? We might begin by recognizing that taking flight across the treacher treacherous oceans is another example of what we might term a non-decision decision. Faced with terrifying conditions, such as the only wage that is competing promises of, of a terrifying encounter, the capacity for acting freely is fully denied, save giving oneself over to the mercy of a less certain alternative. The less certain becomes more appealing. As the poet Wasan Shire wrote of home, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Ethically speaking, however, it is important, I would argue, to hold on to the notion here that regardless of how desperate the situation, the flight across the oceans must be seen as an affirmation of the people's humanity. It is impossible to imagine what it must be like to have to watch your family board a small, small dinghy, setting out onto the waters you know to have taken so many lives. What we can do is approach the issue with ethical sensitivity, foregrounding the agency of those facing such a predicament. That is not to say we should hold them responsible for what happens. Where, after all, is there ultimately any choice being made? Instead, it is to recognize the humanity of the victims and their desire for freedom and dignity. This takes us some way into understanding Laurel's point that the victim is more than a problem to be solved and that they might actually be seen as a site for rethink and resistance in the 21st century. Now, I previously introduced the concept of the intolerable um, as a way to highlight and interrogate the mediation of suffering by contemporary neoliberal regimes of power. In doing so, I also drew attention to the ways in which groups such as ISIS mimic the nihilistic logic of the times by utilizing the intolerable for devastating political effect. ISIS, in fact, have mastered the use of symbolic violence in their own scenes of sacrifice. Indeed, if the violence of the 20th century pointed to clear and normalized forms of dehumanization to bring about the slaughter of millions, what marks a difference with ISIS is precisely the foregrounding of the human as a sacrificial category. The sacrificial victim with ISIS is inscribed with clear symbolic value, whether they are the aid worker, the journalist, or the homosexual. In doing so, they've already forced us to reflect more purposefully on the relationship between intolerability performance of killing and the ethical question of sacrifice. Building on from the work of Walter Benjamin, amongst others, we owe it to Giorgio Agamben for pushing forward our idea on our, our thinking on the idea of sacrifice as a fundamental political category in terms of thinking about willful, calculated and the systemic killing of human lives. As he purposefully articulates throughout his Homo Sarka series, the dehumanized subject, what he calls bare life, refers precisely to those, what, to, to quote, those lives which are killed without a sacrifice. 
Namely, it's a life which is killed without a crime being committed. Hence, unlike Carl Schmitt's well-established idea that the political is all about demarcating who is a friend and who is an enemy, for a Gambon, the history of sovereignty is all about determining which lives might be killed without a sacrifice being made, without any crime being committed. This takes us into some of the discourse concerning the state of exception. Sacrifice for a Gambon retains something of a positive value. Now, in my attempts to bring this categorization into the orbit of intolerable violence today, and I think with the purpose of developing and moving beyond um, some of Agamben's important yet limited structural work, I'm compelled to ask which of those lives are being killed today without a crime being seen to be committed, even though they appear as that a sacrifice has been taking place. And what does this allow us to then further understand in terms of the intolerable while interrogating with renewed purpose and ethical awareness the hidden order of politics in the contemporary moment. To me, it seems that far too much attention, as with Agamben's work in particular, focuses on the death without sacrifice, rather than the symbolic value of the sacrificial and how this functions as a means for continuation violence in the name of justice. My understanding of the sacrificial, I hope, points into a different direction. If the question of the intolerable, I've argued, designates a political category, which provides us with some critical insight into the threshold between acceptable and unacceptable forms of violence, the tolerable being the acceptable face of violence, the to sorry, the tolerable being the acceptable face of violence, the intolerable, the unacceptable face of violence. It is the sacrificial which nuances our understanding by foregrounding the human qualities of the victims. It asks what symbolic value is being inscribed upon the bodies of victims. In this regard, the sacrificial refers us precisely to those deaths which in a symbolic order of things are signalled as purposeful for public consumption. And in the process of assuming certain symbolic value, underwrite the logics of violence to come. Now, as I've tried to um, argue in this talk, um, sacrificial tropes proliferate to the contemporary political moment. In doing so, they've connected the theological and the secular in ways that demand much more sustained and considered critique beyond simple claims of institutional separation. And yet, like violence, the term sacred proves very difficult to, in terms of offering a clear and definitive um, explanation. Again, nobody understood this better than Georges Bataille, who theorized in dense and challenging ways the links between intolerable aesthetics and the sacred. And as he says, we can, know, we can offer no working justifiable definition of what the sacred means. But what we can do is understand how sacrifice looks and is represented as an image such that the death in sacrifice functions, operates and circulates throughout the social order. Alian has come to embody the sacrificial victim. The image of his body concentrated our attention on the bloody reality of the situation. Has his tragic death brought about calls for more ethically sensitive and humane responses to the crisis and also for calls for justice in the name of violence? But what would happen to the body of Alien had this image, like so many others, eluded public attention? What if the body of the image hadn't captured the attention of picture editors at that particular moment in time? What if his body, like so many others, perished at sea and vanished without a trace instead of being washed up on the shores? What if a lion had been shot on the very same day? Hence, the death of this young innocent child simply registered as yet another statistic in the ongoing production of nameless and faceless victims. Could we then have used the term sacrifice to describe the violence if in death there was no notable crime attached or subsequent cause attributed? A death with sacrifice requires the sacrificial victim to assume certain symbolic value. The death appears worthy of something, however tragic, that is value to be attributed. Here, then, what I'm trying to map out is an encounter um, between a fundamental difference between the wider tragedy of human disposability, whose numbers continue to be written and yet whose biographies remain forgotten, against those who we come to attribute a certain metaphysical meaning to the suffering by the sheer fact of witnessing their death. However, there is a danger here, because once the sacrificial enters into political discourse, Complicity is easily written out of the script, and the furtherance of violence appears all too easy. With this in mind, it's part of my ambition with the project to develop our understanding of contemporary violence by reorienting our position on the meaning of disposable lives. 
And this will be achieved by providing further conceptual insight into the interplay between the intolerable and the sacrificial. The new geographies of violence we encounter today are forcing us to confront the brutalities of the world interior. Every surface now holds the potential to be problematic, just as our very understanding of spatial integrities and belonging are being radically altered by the very idea of an endangered and an endangering life world system. Nature as such, the waters most certainly included, appear more important than ever in terms of political insight and critical awareness. Their embodied form are also demanding a force change in the ongoing reconceptualization of political terms, such as freedoms, liberties, rights, and justice, which are ways are much more attendant to global human occupancy. The intellectual dangers of this broadened worldly focus are, however, painfully evident, demanding more vigilance to the creation of fascistic earths. Naturalism and social Darwinism have rightly been discredited from both a political and philosophical perspective. Perniciously underwriting the history of racial prejudice, prejudice both naturalized and embedded through discourses of survivability, its centrality to colonial subjugation has been purposefully explored. Yet despite these critical histories of violence, many of its logics still appear in troubling and sophisticated ways. Theorists of survivalist aptitudes are often detected in, in associated pathologization of neoliberal casualties, while popularized academics such as Richard Dawkins often fall back upon theories of natural selection in their own intellectually violent crusades. Naturalism has also made a comeback in the theaters of war today, as representations of environmental inhospitability are often invoked to designate the inhospitability of peoples. The environment has been increasingly drawn into war paradigms such that the questions of bad environmental stewardship, excluding the corporate, are increasingly tied to the causes of conflict and instability in zones of crisis, already blighted by poverty and suffering. As nature increasingly appears central to political and military de deliberations and concerns, there is a need to rethink politics of nature in a ways that allow for much more purposeful critique. Moving beyond then asking what is natural and how the natural realm appears endangered, our task is to look at the way in which the elements of nature function politically, thereby conducting what I'm elected to term also in another chapter in the book, A Natural History of Violence, which is crucial to understanding violent geographies of today. To conclude, I would like to draw your attention to Bill Viola's Martyrs installation, which is permanently on display in the South Choir Isle of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. This work, I believe, offers a remarkable example of the aesthetic interplay between violence, sacrifice, mediatized victims, and the elements of nature. The title itself, Martyrs, immediately invokes political and theological connotations, not least the question of sacrifice. Depicting four figures on large rectangular plasma screens, visibly overwhelmed as they are subsumed to, to, uh, submitted to an intense physical trial, the work speaks directly to human suffering. Each of the bodies in the installation are exposed to the violence of the elements as earth, air, fire and water gradually place intolerable pressures on the powerless and immobile subjects. The overall sequence lasts several minutes. Aside from the fact that the work follows a familiar hist historical tradition of the spiritual commissioning of artworks for pro prominent religious sites across the world, the religiosity at play here is all too apparent. Viola's four martyrs appear as victims who are subjected to a much slower earthly catastrophe. They embody, we might argue, the foregrounding of life, which is enduring suffering in our full physical gaze, which is demanding us, of us a forced witnessing, so that we're able to appreciate the predicament of earthly catastrophe in the times of its crisis. Giorgio Agamben, in his book, Nymphs, has understood the value of the importance of the temporal sequencing of Viola's work, writing, if one had to define the specific achievement of Viola's videos with a formula, one could say that they insert not the image in time, but time in the image. And because the real paradigm of life in the modern era is not movement, but time, this means there is a life to the image that is our task to understand. Agamben's attention here to what we might properly describe as being the psychic life of images as a means for opening up new critical discussions on the political places it in direct confrontation with what he calls spectral destiny. It's not about constructing, to quote, the image of the body. It's about constructing the body of the image. Might we not apply the same insight to the image of Alien and ask, what is the body of his image? What was the time of his crisis?
such that we might liberate its wider political significance, liberate the life of the image. As Viola explains in a passage cited by Agamben, the essence of the visual medium is time. Images live within us. At this moment, we each have an extensive visual world inside us. We are living databases of images, collectors of images, and these images do not st stop transforming and growing once they get inside us. It's how these images are mobilized which becomes key to how the intolerable is apprehended in the present moment. It is the right of the politics of disposability long before the bodies end up washed up on the planetary shores. It is to reimagine the, heart, the art of the political by harnessing the power of the ascetics to the liberation of the global oppressed. This requires, I would argue, liberating the spectacle of, of violence and its intolerable depictions from the scene of the sacrificial, for it's you that the memory of violence is inscribed with the logics of violence to come. To end, I would like to leave you with this following quote from Jacques Rancière in his, from his book, Figures of History. And as Rancière writes, uh, now we have to revise Adorno's famous phrase according to which art is impossible after Auschwitz. The reverse is true. After Auschwitz, to show Auschwitz, art is the only thing possible because it is the very job of art to reveal something that is invisible through the controlled power of words and images connected or unconnected, because art alone thereby makes the human perceptible. I take this statement as both a provocation and a call to rethink the very idea of the political itself. It is to instigate new conversations between critical theorists, artists, artists writers, and poets, with the aim of challenging the intolerable with more poetic and affirmative responses. Thank you for listening. <laughs>